Hey folks, welcome to the Scrum, Politico's weekly podcast. I'm Jonathan Allen in the Politico newsroom with defense reporter Lee Munsell and national political reporter James Homan. Our topic this week, the odd couple, Paul Ryan and Patty Murray, who struck a bipartisan budget deal. But before we dig deep into that, I want to get the headlines of the week from James and Lee. And, you know, this is a Texas-themed uh, podcast today, mainly because we've got a couple of folks working on the uh, the background, the audio, uh, who are from Texas, Lee from Texas. We've been talking about the Houston Astros. James, a big fan of uh, the Stars at Night, uh, the song Deep in the Heart of Texas that gets played at Astros games. Apparently, James is the only one ever going to an Astros game. But I do want to get your sense, guys, back to politics, what the headlines of the week are. James, what's your big headline of the week? The House gets its act together. <laughs> Uh, and and the you know compromise happens. We avoided having to work over Christmas or the holidays uh, this time, and uh, which was uh, somewhat refreshing. The House of Cards being built instead of destroyed in Washington. <laughs> exactly. And uh, Lee, what about you? What's your big headline? Well, uh, speaking of the House of Cards, they came out with a teaser trailer today, so look out for that on Valentine's Day. Um, but yeah, we were. It's really interesting what happened this week. It it was completely a big step um, in the House and, and getting out of here for Christmas. I think a lot of political reporters are happy about that and members of Congress as well. So it'll be nice to kind of have things wrapped up if they do get wrapped up here in the next few days. There's nothing more hashtag this town than settling in for Valentine's Day with your sweetie to watch House of Cards. Uh, but let's shift to our topic of the week. Uh, the budget deal uh, the House uh, often uh, obviously very divided on partisan lines and even within uh, parties at times, but they got this bipartisan budget agreement on Thursday night. Uh, James, why do you think they got this big bipartisan vote? Both sides saw an advantage in getting this over with. Republicans want to keep the focus on Obamacare and all of the problems with the rollout. Democrats in January want to have a fight over extending emergency unemployment benefits, and so avoiding a lot of talk about the deficit and the debt and you know, sequester and all these different things, lets them come back to that in January. And everyone wanted to avoid their holidays being ruined once again by a, a Congress that can't get anything done. Washington, the only place in the world where both teams can simultaneously punt. Is that, <laughs> is that right? um, and uh, Lee, what, what are your thoughts on this? Are there other, uh, other things that, that sort of played into this? Obviously, um, some pressure uh, on the sequestration front. I know you do a lot of defense coverage mainly defense coverage. So uh, what, what's your thought on that? Well, absolutely. For sequestration, it kind of it changes the game a little bit right now for the defense industry and for the Pentagon. Um, we're seeing sequester cuts get pushed off um, at least uh, temporarily for the next couple of years. So it's a bit more sequester relief than we've seen in the past um, and potentially could allow um, for a National Defense Authorization Act, a standard budget process, which we haven't seen in a while from the Pentagon, to actually get underway. And what's going on with the uh, small group of people on the uh six to one essentially losing side the uh the members of congress the members of the house of representatives that voted against this deal what was driving some of those votes well, some of those votes are, are just uh, very clearly in opposition of any deal that um, gives ground. I mean, we see Rand Paul and, and Kelly Ayotte, some other people who are not too thrilled with the budget deal um, because it, it gives ground on some of the things they don't want to. So, James, what do you what do you politics, think? John? <laughs> politics drove it. I think the uh, you know Democrats want to. They feel like they've been forced to take a lot of these tough votes, and they want to show that that this isn't doesn't go far enough and you know you saw standing Hoyer vote against it you know the, that side of it better on the Republican side uh, a lot of the 2016 potential presidential candidates who want to put some distance between themselves and an unpopular deal that uh, opposed it and you know you saw opposition driven by a desire to to contrast themselves with Paul Ryan you know Paul Ryan the deal maker here and this gives Marco Rubio and, and Ted Cruz and some others a chance to to put some distance. What's going on here with the Republican Party at large? I mean, John Boehner really put his foot down here, especially against uh, the conservative groups, uh, particularly like Heritage Action, mm -hmm. like uh, like the Club for Growth, who were appealing for no votes from Republicans. They didn't get what they wanted. Uh, it seems like the first time in a long time the leadership has really uh, taken a strong stance against them and won. What's what's driving that? <laughs> frustration is, is driving it. I think that there's an immense deal of frustration among John Boehner. He's watched for the last two years as these random groups that he thinks are run by, you know, people who aren't accountable uh, or kind of have needled him and pushed him and, and controlled him. And he thinks that this is a good deal and he wants to, to 
not have another government shutdown. And I think that he knew he would have the votes and the support for this. So he was a little bit eager to, to finally kind of take a slap at some of these people who are men, who, you know, what's been a private frustration boiled over in public this week this is not a new frustration this is something that you know we've heard in background background conversations for for the last three years but it's not just that uh that john banner took a stand it's that people in the republican caucus stood republican with him. conference stood with him right right and that's a, that's a difference and i wonder one of the things that i've been sort of watching here is i wonder the extent to which the government shut down uh, and the difficulty republicans had uh during that period politically uh, what they lost in being able to attack the health care law, whether you think that may have driven some of these members to stand with John Boehner instead of the, the conservative outside groups. Yeah, and it's not just the fact that it, it kept the conversation away from health care. It also hurt these guys. I think people went back, and there was a, a very small block of support for the shutdown, especially after two weeks in. And people even from conservative districts, I think, heard an earful from their constituents and, and didn't want to have to do this again. They didn't. They felt, I think, the, the this time, as the conservative groups were crying wolf, they w- were willing and able to say, no, the constituents back in my district don't want what you're calling on me to do. Seems like most Americans, uh, whether or not they want a smaller government, certainly want the one they have to operate. Yeah, I think that that's what we saw this week, and that's and and I think that you saw that realistic streak, the pragmatic streak, in Republican politics, uh, assert itself. That said, you clearly saw from the 2016 contenders a belief that the Republican Party is not about to moderate, and, and you know Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz and Rand Paul opposing the deal all suggest that they think you know, the the conservative base is going to is still going to be in a no compromise mood come January 2016. Lee, one of the interesting dynamics in this debate was you saw uh, some leadership on the House uh, Armed Services Committee on the Republican side really make the case that the sequester had to be eased uh, for the Pentagon to do all of its work. Can you take us a little bit inside what this deal does, uh, not just uh, for Pentagon spending overall, but also uh, talk a little bit about the cost of living adjustments for retired vets and how military groups are receiving that news? Yeah, it it actually was kind of interesting. There's um, kind of cautious optimism from the defense industry and from um, the Pentagon in general about this deal. Overall, they like it. Um, Overall, it it gets rid of sequester cuts. It deals with the readiness problem that we were going to see over the next couple of years if the cuts were as deep as we were told they were going to be. But now this kind of postpones sequestration, but it doesn't turn it off altogether. Um, And these cost of living adjustments, this is something that um, has kind of bubbled up as an issue over the past couple of days. But um, the military Military um, Officers Association of America is, is kind of really harping on this and saying that there are devastating unintended consequences of changing the cost of living um, by a percentage point for retired military veterans. Um, so it's really just kind of a small budgetary thing, moving things around, um, trying to get rid of some of these overhead costs in the Pentagon. But um, the, the Military Officer Association of America says that it's going to cut um, retired vets' pay by about 20% um, over the years that they're. Um, actually retired. So they're saying that it's going to have a big impact. Um, and Senator Murray's uh, office did kind of crunch the numbers on that as well. And they think it's more like about a 9% um, cut to retired pay. But still, that's a significant chunk. Um, and these regulatory overhead costs at the Pentagon have been talked about a lot. Um, and there are a lot of things that need to be changed there. This deal doesn't deal with very much of it. Um, but that's some of the things we'll start to see in the next few years. During the, uh, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and obviously there's still uh, American military presence in Afghanistan and a big uh, American contingent, uh, I think a variety of agencies in Iraq, uh, there was a, a real push to increase veterans' benefits. Uh, are we seeing uh, with the, the closing down, the winding down of those wars, less attention to vets? Is that what's going on here or just purely a budgetary need? What's the... Yeah, there, there's kind of, um, people are kind of torn about it because obviously veterans coming back from, from recent engagements, um, there's going to be a lot of sentiment to want to expand veterans benefits, make sure the VA backlog is taken care of, that we're taking care of our veterans because they've served on our behalf. But um, there's also the situation with the budget um, and overall coming out of foreign wars like Iraq and, Afgan- Iraq and Afghanistan, um, the budget typically goes down. There's kind of a, a swinging Pentagon budget over the years. 
And right now, even um, without sequester, the budget going down doesn't go as low as we've gone in previous post-engagement times. And so um, there's kind of the give and take with that, taking care of veterans, but also being able to cut costs because we're not going to be having as big of, of an, a standing army as we've had in the past. And that was always a concern in building uh, for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, that it would become a new normal for the Pentagon, that those funding levels would never come back down. Uh, and I think it's, it's interesting that even uh, a little bit of a cut to the Pentagon's budget is considered to be uh, devastating after we've seen these huge increases over the last uh, last decade or so. Uh, one more thing uh, before we break, James, I wanted to touch on uh, Marco Rubio. He said the budget deal threatens the American dream, uh, which has led to a little fight between Paul Ryan and Marco Rubio. Uh, and they, they have these nice quips for each other. Paul Ryan on television the other morning uh, on Morning Joe, a favorite of all conservatives. Read I know. the damn bill. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's what he said to Marco Rubio. Uh, what's going on with these two guys? Uh, are they prepping for 2016? Are they just legitimately angry at each other? Do they think the other one's posturing or yeah, politicizing. Yeah, I think, I think Paul Ryan thinks that Marco Rubio is, is not serious and isn't a wonk and that he's trying to posture for 16. And I think Rubio thinks that, that Ryan is trying to, you know, grandstand and take advantage of this big deal and present himself as the deal maker. Remember, Rubio couldn't get immigration done and uh, Ryan is getting this deal done. Uh, there's obviously implications for Ryan, which we could talk about, on, uh, you know, for becoming speaker down the road or, or improving his standing uh, in the Republican conference. But so I, I do think that there's frustration. A year ago, right after the election, uh, both of them were awarded prizes at a Jack Kemp dinner and they spoke back to back, and there were some early signs of tension. Uh, Ken, uh, Rubio talking about the middle class a ton, and Ryan talking about Republicans needing to help the poor, and, and just a difference in priorities. Right. And I think you're seeing some of that this week. Uh, I also, I, I don't think that they, they have a lot of personal rapport uh, that, you know, that, that goes beyond kind of the, what we see in public. I think we need a Matt Worker cartoon uh, in Politico, which obviously doesn't work so well on the podcast, but maybe if you get the print version or go online, uh, hopefully we get him to draw up some sort of Marco Rubio, uh, Paul Ryan death match, like a cage match between the two of them. Who do you think comes out on top, James? Pass. Pass. What about <laughs> you, Lee? I, I don't know if I want to answer that one. I'm going for Paul Ryan and the P90X. <laughs> I mean, in a fight. Uh, you know. Yeah, I, like, it, right. If they were playing a... Uh, they were playing a game of pickup basketball. I feel like Rubio could win, and if it was a, a run, I feel like Ryan could win. We need the Ryan Rubio decathlon. <laughs> uh, and, but sponsored by Politico. Sponsored by Politico. Speaking of which, we're going to take a uh, quick break for some programming notes. Uh, we'll be right back with more from Lee Munsell and James Homan and our highlights round. Hey, podcast listeners, uh, Mike Allen is uh, packing up your uh, morning schedule right before the holiday break here. He has two playbook breakfasts next week. The first is Wednesday, December 18th at 8 a.m. at the Museum, and that is a special media roundtable. Uh, Peter Baker, Mark Leibovich, Kelly O'Donnell, Jake Tapper, and, of course, Mike Allen will be hosting. Uh, for more information, check out politico.com slash events. And the second one of the week is the next day on Thursday, December 19th at 8 a.m. That's also at the museum. Uh, slightly different topic, though. Uh, Mike Allen will be interviewing Richard Trumpka, president of the AFL-CIO, uh, talking about uh, policy politics and the news of the day. Uh, again, for more information, uh, check out politico.com slash events. Both of those will be streaming live at politico.com slash live. Now, back to the show. Welcome back to The Scrum. I'm here with Politico's Lee Munsell and James Homan. Reminder, I'm Jonathan Allen. It's time for our highlights round. We're going to touch on some big moments from the week, and I'll ask James and Lee for their quick takes. This could be dangerous. Here we go. Fox News' Megyn Kelly, James, uh, declared on a show that both Santa Claus and Jesus were white saying just because it makes you uncomfortable doesn't mean it has to change. Reaction? Megyn Kelly was not on the air Thursday night, notably. Uh, we don't know what kind of internal dynamic is happening there. It was obviously fodder for a lot of late-night comedians uh, to riff, and uh, I think you know it, it, it speaks to a broader problem and challenge that Fox has. 
And Lee, uh, what's your take? Well, you know, it's, it's definitely one of those talky stories. Everybody's talking about it. Um, and Megyn Kelly certainly, um, you know, it, it seems like it's, it's the sort of thing that shouldn't cause a big, a big ruckus, but yet you have to be really careful how you talk about those sorts of kind of fun stories. And so I think she kind of stepped in it a little bit, and so now she's, she's backpedaling, certainly. Having met neither Santa Claus nor Jesus myself, I will take the moderator's prerogative and not comment on this one at all. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Obama's selfie at Nelson Mandela's funeral, Lee, was that a harmless picture or a photo pa? <laughs> That's a good one. Hashtag photo pa. Let's get that trending. Um, you know, it, it's one of those things also that the photographer tried to kind of defend what was going on, that it was just kind of a casual moment between uh, world leaders. Um, you know, they're human beings. They're, they take a selfie, but, you know funeral selfies are also there's there's a meme about that that that's a joke that's common on the internet and so he kind of played into that also and so you know it is one of those ones that it, who knows if it if it causes a stir but it, it certainly got people talking james harmless or is this like a miley cyrus bad judgment moment yeah i i don't think it's a miley cyrus bad judgment moment <laughs> i think it's humanizing and and a reminder that these are real people and i uh it was disappointing because it it, it distracted from remembering Mandela, who's an important historic figure and who President Obama flew across the world to go honor. And so it was it was kind of sad to see the freak show mobilize into action over it. Uh, Raul Castro, uh, the president sh sh shook his hand. There was a big to do made out of, uh, over that, James. Uh, I shook the president's hand last night at the White House Christmas party. My first time it was really, really exciting. And was I, that I a, a, an wonder, endorsement? Well, you know, what I was wondering, you know, it was like by the commutative property of communism, whether I am a communist for shaking the hand of somebody <laughs> who shook. Uh, is that, is, was much ado being made of nothing of that moment or, or does it moment. matter? It's a moment. And I think it, Why does you know, it I don't, matter? I don't think it, I don't think it matters as much as, as some of the president's critics w want, you know, to impute meaning on it. But it certainly is significant. This is the first time an American president has shaken a Cuban leader's hand. Uh, since the revolution, the communists took over in, in 1960. So I think that since this, before we, any of us were born, uh, yeah, long before any. Yeah, of us and were born. so I, I think it, it matters, but I don't think it. You know, there's not it, there's not a huge policy change behind it. Although I mean, this follows a lot of conciliatory moves by this administration towards the Cubans, and uh, you know, we we know how important Cuba is in, in Florida, the Cuban issue is in Florida, which is a, a critical swing state. From one perspective, it should be no surprise. The president had said that he was going to sit down with uh, the leaders of uh, you know, the sort of the bad guy nations, as it yeah. were, during his campaign in 2008. Obviously, that didn't happen. We've talked to the Iranians, and we're, you know, we, and we're, or the, not we, the administration is. Uh, is Bill Burns right. from, and, and, uh, and Jake Sullivan from right. the State Department. Jake Sullivan now with Biden's office, but yep. yes. <laughs> not, not you and I. <laughs> right. <laughs> Or not you and me. God, that's terrible. <laughs> I would never write that that way. Uh, Lee, uh, wh what are your thoughts on the uh, the Castro handshake? Well, I think I think James made the right point that um, you know it's this administration is reaching out to people that we haven't necessarily reached out to before, and and it's um, you know I, I guess I kind of think of it along the lines of what would a snub have done um, if he hadn't shaken his hand, and so maybe it was just a situation where a handshake was required and, and a handshake was given. Always hard when somebody extends their hand, not to extend yours back. Uh, and uh, so House of Cards season two, this is the really compelling political question. Uh, Lee, you teased it earlier with the Valentine's teaser trailer uh, that you've seen. I have not seen it. Uh, what can we expect, Lee, do you think, from House of Cards season two? And more important, do you think the show's true to reality? <laughs> I think the show is not true to reality. Um, I get that question a lot, actually, unfortunately. Um, I do, too. That it, it's, it's a very, very dramatized version of Washington. And obviously, it makes for good television. It makes for good watching. But um, it's not, not necessarily an accurate reflection of reporter-source relationships, I would say. And I think wait, 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 now, wait a second. That was, a, that was like a really tame way of saying that. I think what you're trying to say is we don't know a whole lot of reporters that are sleeping with members of the Democratic leadership. Is that... <laughs> Is that a fair way to that, put it? That's also a thing I would say. <laughs> that we know of. <laughs> right. Well, I, I would. I, we had a group of foreign journalists vid visiting the Politico newsroom recently, and and they raised their hands and and earnestly asked me how how realistic it was and if it was just if it was if it was a reality show essentially. So that was kind of funny. I think that the second season is going to be more violent than the first, if that was at all if possible. Po I don't want to spoil possible? the end of season one, but the kicker of the trailer, which is, is worth watching, pretty dramatic two minutes, is let the bloodbath begin. 
So, uh, so time will uh, tune in on February 14th. Maybe that's a political bloodbath, like redistricting or something, right? <laughs> like, it could Maybe. be. Could I'm, be. I'm sure there's a double meaning with politics there. So, um, sadly, it's time for shout-outs, which means the end of the show. But positively, we get to hear something good. Uh, we'll go quickly uh, around the rim of the table here because we don't actually have a circular table. Uh, curious. Lee, what's your big read this week? Who'd you follow on Twitter? What restaurant do you like? Who's your shout out for? Well, um, you know, I, I'm not sure about the must follow, but um, John Kirby actually got appointed to be the Pentagon press secretary. That came out today. So um, a new person to watch. Um, he takes over for George Little, um, certainly. I don't know if he's on Twitter, actually. I should have looked that up previously. But if he's on Twitter, follow him. Uh, yeah, often, New voice of the Pentagon. Uh, uh, he should be on Twitter. There are some people in the Pentagon probably shouldn't be on Twitter. Uh, James, <laughs> what's, what's your shout-out this week? To uh, my colleagues as we enter this holiday season for uh, ag- aggressively covering the, the budget fight on the Hill this week. Wow, that's really nice. I'm going to shout-out as well. Uh, I'm going to shout-out to Mac McGarry, the longtime host of It's Academic here in the Washington area. Uh, gave a lot of scholarship money uh, from Giant Foods out to students over the years on a, a competitive quiz bowl like show. He died uh, this week, and uh, rest in peace, Mac. Uh, I, I personally it was a big moment for me the first time I appeared on its academic because uh, it was such a Washington tradition, and uh, and to have him say your name was a really big deal for for youngsters. So, uh, rest in peace, Mac. Uh, Lee Monsell and James Homan, thank you for coming on. Listeners, thank you for listening. Uh, If you want even more on the budget deal, head to politico.com. You can find us uh, there. You can also find the podcast there at politico.com slash podcast. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, too. Sounds like the reindeer. I'm Jonathan Allen. That's The Scrum. Thank you for listening. (laughs) 